Apart from all this great gear that we have here, I'd like to discuss a very important aspect, and that is the acoustics and the environment in which you're going to be working. I'd like to introduce you to a very old friend of mine who is probably one of the world's best studio designers, three-time tech award winner from Mix Magazine, designed studios like Electric Lady, home studios for Whitney Houston, Rick Rubin, Ace Frehley, studios like that. Dear friend, John Sturrock. Hey, Johnny. Eddie. Good to see you. Good to see you, mate. I'm glad you could join us in our project studio. What do you think? Pretty nice. Looks great. Everything's where it's supposed to be. Let's go to work. See ya. Okay. For 25 years, I've been designing recording studios, uh, radio stations, video production facilities, and uh, all kinds of related media facilities. It's very exciting. Um, the home studio, or project studio, as it's been known to be called over the last 10 years, is an exciting uh, example of those kind of facilities. And we have here today an even more interesting example because we're going to mix and uh, produce in one section of the room and use another section of the room for uh, microphone work. So it's got uh, a number of idiosyncrasies to it. But before we're going to take a look at the surfaces and the treatments, we've got to do a little bit of uh, fundamentals, uh, fundamental review of acoustics itself. So let's discuss acoustics in general. What is sound? It's a form of energy caused by a variation or fluctuation of pressure in a medium. In this case, the medium is air. These energy fluctuations, these, these acoustical variations in pressure, are typically generated by speakers or instruments or people's voices and typically received by microphones. Then they're transferred to electrical energy where these responses can be altered or manipulated or stored. The changing of this acoustic energy to and from electric energy is accomplished by devices called transducers. Speakers are examples of transducers. In studio acoustics, we have two issues we have to deal with, transmission acoustics and internal room acoustics. Transmission acoustics have to do with uh, everything responsible for making our room quiet, and I think it's pretty obvious why that's important. Internal room acoustics is a little bit more complex. That has to do with all the elements that we see on the, on the surfaces of our rooms, diffusers, absorbers, the shape of the room, the size of the room, and basically that has to do with guaranteeing that our recording sounds good and our microphone and our playback information is not colored or distorted so we can make good judgments. Now let's start to take a very specific look at our project studio. Here we are in a room that is 14 feet wide, 19 feet long, and 10 feet high. This particular studio is a combo format. In other words, this room is doubling as a control room and as a recording room. This causes certain complications when overdubbing, but I'm sure Eddie's going to discuss that later. Certainly we recognize that this room should be made as quiet as possible. But how quiet? quiet enough not to disturb information being picked up on the microphones. Creating these quiet spaces can sometimes be tricky and can sometimes be expensive, but there are some tips. First of all, try and choose a space that's quiet to begin with and one that doesn't have any noisy neighbors. The other, probably the, the, the most important tip for Project Studios has to do with windows and doors to your rooms, okay? Make sure they're sealed. Use acoustical caulking, use rubber gasketing, use prefabricated drop seals. There's quite a few things on the market and they're not that complicated to install. Musicians in general like to listen to music in reverberant spaces. They kind of like to get a type of feedback from the music or the sound being played. But too much of this will color the sound and add or subtract different pieces of information on our tape. We have to be very careful of this when we're recording. How do we eliminate frequency-based coloration? How do we get the reverberation in our room to sound just about right? Uh, how do we prevent harsh reflections from bouncing around certain surfaces and disturbing us? Let's take a look at some issues that we have to deal with. One of the first things we can do is essentially eliminate the room. Sounds a little bit strange, but essentially that's what near-field monitoring does. What is near-field monitoring? Basically, monitors that are close to the listening position, near-field. These monitors and their proximity to our ear basically eliminate most of the room during the playback mode of recording. Even still, we still have another concept to deal with, and that has to do with initial time delay gap. The near field monitors will issue a direct sound wave, which will come right to my ear. However, there'll be some secondary sound that also comes out of the speaker, bounces off the console, and comes back up to my ear. This secondary sound, traveling at the same speed as the primary sound, will arrive a little bit later. That difference in time is what's called the initial time delay gap, and it has to be just right or else we'll uh, lose 
such things as stereo focusing and uh, a kind of clarity or crispness of the sound. A good tip is to actually take your near fields and push them back one or two feet as we've done here. Generally speaking, unless the ratios of a room are well designed, it's advisable to introduce low frequency absorption. We can do this with low frequency traps, Helmholtz resonators, deep absorbers, and other kinds of devices as you can see in the photos. Now we're going to talk about the treatments. The first set of treatments I want to discuss are in the front of the room. They're the most important ones, and if you have to put one treatment in one place in your room, these are the ones you want to do. These are mid and high frequency absorbers. They're the ones that stop the most disastrous bouncing rays that will uh, introduce colored sound to you. The uh, light colored ones are actually fabric wrapped over five to six pound density fiberglass. There are a number of companies that make them. Uh, this particular company is one called Arc Rep. They run anywhere from $50 to $100 a piece, and they're extremely effective. They can be glued on the wall or stick, stick clipped on the wall. Sometimes if you hold them off the wall three or four inches, they'll increase the low frequency absorption, and that's not a bad trick. The second type of mid-high frequency absorber that we're using in the front of our room is uh, these black pyramidal panels, and they're made by uh, Sonics, very popular in studios. They're a little less expensive, and they don't quite come in as many colors and uh, varieties of fabric, but they essentially do the same thing and uh, we're showing that in the front for variety. Let's take a look at some more treatments in the room. These two guitars, they're really not acoustic, but they look good anyway. What are these? These are diffusers. When sound approaches any type of boundary, one or more of three things will happen. We can absorb sound or suck it in. We could reflect sound, which is simply uh, bouncing off the wall and returning into the room or we could diffuse sound. Diffusion is a type of reflection. These diffusers actually scatter the sound or re-radiate the sound back into the room. Um, these wells are carefully designed to do that. There are other types of diffusers. Here are examples of RPG diffusers, and here's another kind. These are made by Systems Development Group. These are called art fusers, and uh, these are 734s. These are a little more expensive, and they come in uh, a variety of uh, shapes and sizes, usually made out of wood. Uh, the art diffusers are a little less expensive and uh, they also are made out of wood, but here we have a very inexpensive model made out of uh, styrofoam, so a lot of this has to do with your personality in a studio. It's an interesting thing about closet doors and other kinds of doors in a room. We can also put a soft absorbing material on one side, okay, and in the case of this door, although it swings the other way, this door actually swings out and we could have a hard surface on one side and a soft surface on the other, so we could kind of use doors uh, to give us a kind of a variable acoustic situation in our room. We could also uh, literally put hinged panels on a room with two kinds of treatments on either side of them, and you see that in the photo right now. In our studio, we've elected to carpet the entire studio floor. Generally speaking, in smaller rooms with low ceilings, this is advisable. Although if the room has a higher than average ceiling, you might elect to put a different kind of surface like wood or tile. Most project studios will have ceilings that are 10 feet or lower. Again, a variety of treatments can be used on ceilings, although they take a little bit more experience to design and implement. Take a look at some of these photos. We spent some time reviewing acoustic principles and some very specific treatments in our project studio. Don't forget acoustics, it's very important. Everything on these walls and including our carpet, has actually cost less than $5,000. We could have also very effectively treated this room for as little as $3,000. Acoustics are very important. It's the first step in a good recording. Good luck.